Nezarek Final God of Pain is available for a limited time at my merch store down below. You don't want to miss out on this limited time drop. It comes in handwritten kanji version and a nightmare version. Trust me, Nogi-san is amazing at what she does. She put a ton of love into this. Don't miss it. This was the hardest video I have ever made, and will definitely make or break some hearts after we're done here. I ranked every single raid encounter in Destiny, from vanilla up until now. And you know how much fun it is sitting there, playing an old raid, then a remaster, then oh wait, I can't play some of these raids, so how biased is this list really gonna be? My goal with determining the rankings wasn't based on loot, or the first time experience, since those would be ranking raids overall. This list is the encounters, and there's only a couple of parameters. How do they hold up, and would I want to play them after getting all the loot? Simple parameters, right? Roast me in the comments all you want. This is the placement for all raids that have jumping puzzles and anything like an entrance, since none of these are encounters. If they don't have a respawn restricted, they don't count. But these all have something pretty sweet and unique about them. If you want me to make a video on the jumping puzzles and other things like ranking the loot, please like this video. Because if this hits 10,000 likes, I'll do it. Oh, and also subscribe to my variety channel, where I pledged to make a documentary on Elden Ring's tutorial boss that became the meme of the community, the Soldier of Godric. It's basically Destiny's version of Randall the Vandal. Number 70. If clearing enemies was an encounter, then... Wait, clearing enemies is an encounter? Yeah, Eater of Worlds was a rough time for Destiny and Curse of Osiris, but nothing was as bad as making it a full encounter. After the opening jumping puzzle, the first encounter was to just kill waves of Cabal off a ship for a chest. And yeah, you could wipe here. This is easily the worst example of raid layers instead of full raids, and I was baffled this was even an encounter at all. Number 69. Nice. This is the encounter on D1 LFG that we all just wanted to get a checkpoint past. No, not even because it was hard, but because it was another clear enemy's encounter, which didn't even have loot past materials anyways. Confluxes was rough. Being the first raid in Bungie's catalog doesn't help it, but nothing takes you out of a raid like enemies coming from three lines when you have to defend a tower. This felt like a campaign mission more than a raid encounter. Speaking of that encounter, let's see it as a remaster. Number 68. Yeah, Confluxes is here again, and the remaster may have tried to do it better, but there's really no saving it no matter how many champions and wyverns you place here, Bungie. Number 67. Gorgon's remaster is here. But why? I think it's easy to see this as just another jumping obstacle, because it is. But I always look forward to sneaking past the Gorgons on the original Vault of Glass, and the remaster just didn't do it all that well, seeing as you can emote and just walk past them. To be up this high is more of a compliment to the originality these little cute guys had, and the 100% struggle of Gorgons, because while the rest of original Vogue is pretty vanilla, and easier than other raids, I would still argue that Gorgons rack up a ton of deaths, especially if you're not paying attention. It is still pretty low on the list, but it was a unique encounter. Number 66. Crown of Sorrow was one of the best raids that Destiny ever lost, and it's a shame we did end up losing it. But I think I'm very happy to never run this encounter again. The first encounter of Crown of Sorrow, the entrance, was an introduction to crystal swapping mechanics, and worked together to clear the room of the crystals but it was just so long and so boring past day one contest mode. This would have been okay, but it was four very tedious rounds, leading to most people ragging on this raid for this encounter alone. Number 65. King's Fall is a fantastic raid, but it always had one major flaw in the original, plates. Yeah, the fine china is pretty fragile as a raid mechanic, but nothing felt this more than the totems of King's Fall. Totems were a really neat back and forth with a relic keeping someone under a totem on both sides, but it was just a survival and time sink encounter. Three players go left, three go right, grab a buff, make it back to mid with a times 10 of the Death Singer. No way to optimize, just a standard stand and kill. It wasn't bad for the time, but even at the time, you wouldn't exactly be excited for totems. Number 64. Levy has some memorable encounters, but one that always stood out as just not it was the bass encounter. It's just stand on a plate, rotate, kill big bathers, and then move to middle for damage on a boss. 
Nope. Instead, damage on a lamp. Yeah, I think that speaks for itself. I see what actually caused Moth Mommy to come out in Destiny. Number 63. Deep into Vaults of Glass, after all the hurdles and obstacles put against you, one encounter guards the final boss. Rightfully named Gatekeepers, this room was cool for the first time. Gatekeepers is probably the second worst age encounter in Destiny 1 behind Confluxes. And some of these other ones leave a worse taste in your mouth, but the reason it's made it this far is because there was at least a good combination of mechanics. Gatekeeper worked by killing gatekeepers on both sides of the Vault of Glasses portals, then killing the main one in the middle. That's an oversimplification of the encounter, but I mean this encounter was simple, so Bungie completely reset it in Destiny 2. Let it rest in pieces. Number 62. Crota has a bridge, and like our other bridge encounter in this list, this one kind of sucks. Crota's bridge takes a while to get across. I think this encounter is most fun to solo instead of doing it with six, as it's just boring doing it the normal way. Cheese, no cheese, doesn't really stop this one from being where it is on the list. Number 61. Leviathan, Leviathan, Leviathan. While I put bats lower than this one, I do think that dogs just aged poorly. If it weren't for a bit of teamwork to hide from a couple of dogs, then this would be in dead last. Dogs just needed a couple of spores, and then everyone to find their dog and start blasting. That was it, and became the farm for Leviathan armor and arrivals before it was shot and killed in the DCV. Number 60. Gorgons the first time around were a lot harder of an area, and were an actual threat. Any noise made, any run or jump was heard, and they were a pain to kill. Number 59. Root of Nightmares gets its first encounter pretty early on into the list. This is the most recent raid, but don't let any recency bias sway you into thinking that Cataclysm is a great encounter. This one just requires one player to do the mechanics, maybe two if you want to be super efficient, while the rest of you just punch a Scion and kill some adds. This one felt more like a step back in quality nine years into the series than anything since it's just a one, max two player show. It was even soloed on contest difficulty if that shows you anything. The coolest part of this one was the visuals when you connect all the light to the end of each section. Number 58. Crota's End has all kinds of broken encounters, but one that falls low on the list is ur -Ute. If you don't know, this encounter is built on speed, and while it sounds like a unique one, killing every single enemy in the arena and then the boss in a tight timer is mindlessly easy with six players. Bungie even tried to up the ante of the challenge in Age of Triumph, but even this could be soloed easily. Cool idea, but unfortunately not the encounter to take home a top spot. Number 57. Back to Vogue we go. Just as Confluxes was an introduction to raiding period, Oracles was the first introduction of a raid mechanic. Oracles, baby! They were a bit too forgiving for them to be a high rank on this list. Oracles, while cool with sounds and lights, could all be shot from a mile away with Icebreaker, and anyone could shoot all of them in no order at all. Combine this with how long this encounter was, and it just began to drag. Number 56. The Daughters of Oryx are the prereq 2 Oryx, and like any prereq in school, they're just kind of there to be there. The encounter is a lot of plates, and while I like that you get someone chosen to be torn between dimensions at random, I do think that this comes with a price, as the other five just sit there bored. Damage in the middle, and then go to sisters, and bye 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 goes the boss really fast. Number 55. Wrath of the Machine's fourth encounter is often forgotten. Everyone remembers the Siege Engine, Vosik 1 and 2, and Axis, but nobody seems to remember the pretty boring fourth encounter, where you just shot servitors and threw balls at cones of SIVA, then shot hundreds of shanks. Bungie upped the ante for the hard mode on this one by adding these stupid turrets that were definitely annoying as hell, but this one can stay here. Number 54. I call this encounter Spinny to Winnie, and just like the previous Leviathan encounter, this one is also another callous minigame. I loved Gauntlet when it first came out and really enjoyed going back to the room in Season of the Haunted. I thought the mechanic was fun, and figuring it out with my fire team for the first time was special. So I mean no disrespect when I put this one here, but it is here because it's been done better in a seasonal activity. 
Gauntlet was a three-round encounter of running circuits through holes to gain more time to stay alive, and then bringing orbs to the start of the room to dunk. Once all three rounds were done, all six players had to run, and I thought this was the best part. But eventually, it did wear, and even by the end of its days, nobody had to remember which cones to shoot. You just shot all three. The balls at the end were easily cheesable, and... Well, Menagerie did this encounter better with more obstacles and mini bosses to fight. Which, of course, that one had cheeses too. Number 53. Root of Nightmares is back again. And to be fair, the first encounter was a one player show. The second encounter, Scission, is a two player show. Scission was not only soloed on contest as well, but the whole room is built for realistically only two players to do stuff. The rest of the team is just killing ads. This one would be better if you could only advance by killing the immune enemies, but alas, it's not. Also, launch pads just don't work. I know they're putting in an update for this, but come on, man. But I think that part, unless you're going for flawless or <clears throat> world's first, is just more funny than anything. It still finds itself here. Number 52. Garden of Salvation wasn't everyone's favorite raid. Some criticized it for the lack of loot, others for having an anticlimactic finale. So unless you're into it for the gorgeous views, or you're a garden farmer who can't get some bitches, you're probably not a big fan. The second encounter of the raid is the only one I find myself not loving with six players. If this was a three player encounter, then it would be awesome. But with six, it's just a lot of waiting. Link your duo, go left, go right, link, 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 wait for Hydras, go to the middle, do the same. This was another encounter like Crown's Entrance that I feel was built for contest and contest alone. Number 51. Remastered Oracles is much better than the original, but only finds itself here since there is seven rounds of these. I think with a way to instantly begin the next sequence, it would be better, but then again, it's also a memorization encounter, so that wouldn't really work either. Oracles originally wasn't all that great, but the remaster calls for you to coordinate the order and pay attention. I love this one a whole lot more. Number 50. Remastered Totems is better than Totems in every way, and allows for teams to coordinate a more even playing field. This is also the only encounter in Remastered King's Fall that makes every player learn their stuff. And while you do stand on plates, you are always going for a higher tally of kills to make it move faster. It's still not the best encounter, but what Bungie were able to do with the remaster makes this one feel a lot more alive and credit where it's due. Number 49. Morgoth the Spire Keeper is the first Last Wish encounter on the list, and only here because the boss has zero health. Morgoth on a master mode I'm sure would be more menacing, but even on day one players were trying to one phase the boss. The mechanics are awesome and next level compared to a lot of encounters, but Morgoth suffers from being popped like a pimple. Number 48. Remastered Gatekeeper blows the other Gatekeeper out of the water. Yeah, sure, there was some cheesing, and yeah, you can push the Minotaur off the map, but this one is way more involved and actually requires the team coordinate to get the finish. This one requires all six players to be alert in some way, and credit where it's due as Bungie basically redid this encounter from scratch. Number 47. Spire of Stars was the best of the raid layers. But everyone in the Destiny community agreed that the entrance of these raid layers share the worst of the encounters. The entrance of Spire, while fun, definitely is the least fun of this layer. The encounter requires that you charge up balls to throw and then play Hot Potato to keep your plate up so you don't wipe. After three rounds of throw and catch, wait for the shield, then throw, it was over. The struggle came from the enemies all around, but this was pretty easy. I will give it some fun points since throwing balls across the map to a teammate was satisfying as hell, but it's another learn the mechanic encounter. Number 46. I believe this is our first final boss on the list. Which one? Probably not the one you were expecting, but it's Atheon in the original Vault of Glass. Atheon was crazy on day one for raiders that didn't know what they were getting into with the Vault of Glass. Funnier was that this boss could be pushed off the map for a while, but I fail to see Atheon as any meaningful challenge or crazy fun on repeat playthroughs. You push past the idea of loot 
and you're left with a boss that has you basically speed run oracles, jump through the portal, fake him to the ground immediately. Nothing about Atheon really stood out as a crazy cool encounter, but it was really fun for the time. Side note, bosses used to not have those thick health bars on the bottom of the screen, and it really throws me off seeing them without that anymore. Number 45. The Daughters of Oryx was not all that great, but it did prepare you for a boss mechanic really well, and got you familiar with the room you'd be staying in for a while. That being said, the remastered Daughters of Oryx was dealt an odd hand. There wasn't a lot changed. It just did the same role as before in preparing you for a fight with Oryx, but in the new plate mechanic way. Other than that, almost nothing has changed here. Grab three sparks, dunk, do damage. The Daughters are a bit more intimidating, but there's still those Daughters of Oryx we all know and farm for spoils. Number 44. Deepstone Crypt gets its first encounter here on the list, and that should be seen as a compliment to the fun factor of the raid. It's by no means the hardest raid Bungie has cooked up, but it's by far the most chill of them. No pun intended. Deepstone's first encounter has you, well, fighting servers. Is this where Anteater, Fever, and Guitar live, Bungie? Huh? This one isn't bad since it introduces the operator and scanner mechanics, as well as this glass on the floor or ceiling if you're underneath, to see through, adding verticality. But I do think it suffers from the introduce the mechanic feature. Number 43. War Priest in the original King's Fall was a really fun boss to damage. That being said, the encounter has been done better with the remaster. War Priest had you kill adds and avoid these ogre acolytes then standing on plates in the correct order, having one player juggle the aura, and keep refreshing the timer by killing adds, while the rest of you just cook the boss. There isn't really a problem with War Priest, but he has just been done so much better with the remaster, and there's a lot of encounters that are more nuanced. He's just simple and fitting for an easy raid boss. Number 42. Vow the Disciple will not be seen again for a while, but the first encounter, and not the entrance, is Acquisition. Acquisition is a great opening encounter. It gets you familiar with symbols, it gets you familiar with coordinating the callouts, and it lets you know you're about to see all of this for the whole raid. Acquisition's only downside is that only a few people need to seek out the rooms while the teammates sit and shoot ads but at least they're reading to their teammates for what they need to do. This only suffers from being an opening encounter, but don't get me wrong, this one is still good, and even has some secrets most players don't know about. Number 41. Wrath of the Machine also had an opening encounter, but this one beats out acquisition because there is more going on that you'll need to learn, and because it's a boss fight. He may not die, but the loot is right after. It's a great introduction to the pace of the rest of the raid and gets you familiar instantly. This is how you make an opening. Number 40. Bomb, 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 bomb. Yep, he's here. Time to cope. Oryx in the original Destiny was a menacing, terrifying, insane, massive for the first couple of times. Boss! Oryx was an LFG killer for the four phases you had to do, and you had to keep everyone alive and on task, and that just sucked. That's the thing, right? It's plates, and more waiting with plates. A final boss you cannot damage is unique, but to me, not in a good way. I want to shoot Oryx, not stand and let something else do my damage. I like that this one had so much attention to it, like post damage having two options of what happens, and the shade was our real fight, but it did not age well with four phases needing to be done. But don't worry, we would eventually get all of those issues solved in the remaster, and everyone can now agree on the original's problems, but I still think Oryx was at the time pretty cool, so I'm putting him here. Number 39. At the entrance of Last Wish, Bungie dropped a boss named Callie the Corrupted. This boss is now known as the Damage Test boss besides Templar, and this one can be stuck to the ground with an anarchy, but Callie has some fun still. The main issues with Callie really come from the fact that she is just a pushover and the fact that most people aren't gonna do it this way anymore. I still think she's a great introduction to the raid, but I think she's just aged. Number 38. Eater of Worlds is back and Argos' shield needs to go down. Another encounter before the boss 
but this one is just more involved than some of them. Argos' shield needed the matching Vex craniums and did a great job teaching the player that not only should you always cook a Vex cranium, but you should be time present. As you could always tell who was lacking if Arc, Solar, or Void weren't broken in time. Overall, a good encounter, just not better than some on the list. Number 37. Shields, Shields, and More Shields. This won't be the last time we talk about Shields, but it will be the only time we talk about Scourge of the Past Shield Encounter. This one was very unique, and you know I do like it a lot, but I don't love it. My bias comes from the tanks not being that fun of a raid mechanic. Shooting these just doesn't feel as good as shooting a gun in the game. The encounter does have a lot more going on though, like punching the correct symbols twice, this charges players up and lets them get a tank from one of three stations. After killing the servitor to let them out and killing the arc, solar, or void shanks to make sure the tanks don't die instantly, you can damage the shield in the middle of the arena. This was cool because you could get in and out of the tank multiple times over to spam missiles while avoiding the boss's attack. This was one of the best pre-boss encounters and made me really happy to rewatch since well, I can't play it. Number 36. Garden of Salvation is back and you'll never believe who's up here next. It's the harp. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's it's the harpy. Yeah, Consecrated Mind, who is now remixed into a dungeon in Spire of the Watcher, was a fun fight on contest. I still like this guy on the regular raid as the mechanic is basically a race to bank moats. Damage is fun, boss size job is fun. But the modes part is just like Gambit, and I don't like Gambit. I still feel like this has more going on team-wise than most encounters, but it ultimately boils down to three people doing fun stuff, and the other three playing a mode that Bungie hasn't cared about in four years. Not even a map in four years. So yeah. Number 35. Crota is here again, and this time, he's in the pit! Crota's pit was iconic as it was special on repeat playthroughs. Is it ranked fairly high? Yes. Does it deserve this? Yes. It is a unique horror element not really seen since, as it has holes and hordes of thralls chasing you. I miss this feeling in raids of being immersed in the enemy's environment, because sometimes you just want to be in an uncomfortable environment in a raid. And with that music coming in and drowning everything out, all you have to think about is... Oh boy, it was madness. Now, it is easy on repeat playthroughs, and you can just stand on a rock at the end to avoid any troubles, but man, it was special running through. And I always look forward to the race through here more than most things in the raid. Crota, if you do get a remaster, just make this encounter even more special. Number 34. There's something about a relay race encounter being the first in a raid that makes it feel special. And Garden of Salvation's opening is just that. This encounter teaches you so much so early. Working together to open the doors with the tether, the boss was just, uh, bossing on the floors for you to pick up or you wipe. The communication needed to reach the end of each room and each obstacle is really why it lands itself here. As you journey through the other side of the Black Garden from where you were in the Undying Mind Strike in Destiny 1. It's teamwork, it's speed, momentum, violence, and you're gonna wipe at least two times. Number 33. The best encounter in the original Vault of Glass belongs to the Templar. The Templar is not the most complicated boss fight, but what it makes up for in complication is fun factor and maxing out how your team can perform. You can slowly whittle down the Templar as a team, getting detained a bunch of times and having to deal with some oracles, or you could block all of the teleports from the boss and just keep doing damage. But the room will get more intense with Minotaurs pushing you from every direction, so the choice is in your hands. It's this factor that makes the Templar stand above where it would normally be ranked, and it's why it's here. Number 32. Got sick of the Templar? Cool, let's talk about the remaster. It doesn't add a whole lot from the original Templar fight. In fact, it only has two small changes. Shoot the oracles in order of when they spawned, and the Templar only detains one player so that the others need to shoot that player out. In the original, everyone could shoot themselves out, so here in the remaster, you gotta help your teammates. The Templar may just get baked on normal, and even on master with the right plan, 
but it's just a bit more that's added to this fight. And I do look forward to this one for the spoils you get at the end of the day. Number 31. Galron's Deception might be the best way to introduce a boss. You just make a mini version of him. The Deception started on one of the thirds of the arena, while the other two sides had ogres to shoot instead. This boiled down to the crystal mechanic, shooting blessed enemies if you had the Witch's Blessing and non-blessed enemies without it. What was nice about this was it took teammates to free each other from the sides, opening up the arena. While one side had the boss the whole time, the other sides were trying to jailbreak them out of there, which was tied to swapping buffs after killing the ogres. Once it was time for damage, this boiled down to finding teammates with the buff and one without the buff to take down the shield. What we would come to find out later is that this was tied to some sort of server desync, so you could punch, anarchy, shoot, whatever you needed to do, and then run away and have people without the buff punch the boss. So technically, you only needed one player with the Witch's Blessing the whole time. It was still a really fun boss to do damage to regardless. They have now turned the Deception into a dungeon boss, but it was best suited for this raid. Number 30. After a trek through one of the most cinematic jumping puzzles in all of Destiny, listening to an absolute tearjerker while you try to recollect all of those losses of your first owned pet who isn't going to come back, but all you can do is think of the memories filling your brain with each passing moment, of the piano keys hammering down. You sit there, tear in your eye, and then you come across... Panics with legs. Descent is an encounter that does a great job of visual panic and worry across the room. There is three different roles to take care of. The operator, whose job is to shoot a panel at the right time, the suppressor who stands under the beach balls and shoots Tanix, and the scanner who tells everyone what to do with the nukes that come from the operator shooting the panel. You also have to swap one of these out each time, forcing teamwork. The only downside here is that there's only one room and seven rounds of doing this, but the main components that make this encounter work well are the visuals and that teamwork. Also, you can speed up everything by killing the ads in the room. Number 29. Back to DSC, we have... Tanix! Without his legs. In a move that cyberpunk edge runners would shamelessly steal two years later, Tanix enhanced himself with some new body parts. I want to say that this encounter is still fun, even for the laughs of knowing you're just fighting Tanix. But it's just too simple of a boss fight. Kill some adds, shoot the sides of Tanix, grab the nukes, deposit them, and begin damage in Tanix's aura. In total, you can get to damage in about a minute, and the boss is just not a threat. I think if it wasn't Tanix in the seat, it would be a bit cooler, but I can't really say much more on this. There's the suppressor that stuns Tanix and allows the nukes to be deposited, and there's the scanner who does the same role as last time, and the operator who frees teammates from a bubble. Tanix may have a way to speed up the boss fight by dunking all four balls to get to DPS immediately, but this fight really is meh. Number 28. You knew it was gonna come up at some point. Bulk, Nezi, Nezarek is here on the list. Nezarek could have been so much more, but just like Tanix, his mechanics are too simple, and he's just a final boss that missed the mark on upping the stakes. Nezarek's biggest issue is that you never have to do the mechanics. In fact, you'd be better off skipping them completely and going straight to damage. Even if you do the mechanics, it's very simple and was learned in a jumping puzzle. The boss stunning is cool, and the boss does attack you at all times, which is similar to Tanix, but in a much more mobile and fierce way. Bungie has even gone on the record to say that they are going to buff this boss to make him more in line with the final god of pain. But it's unfortunate that Nezi is such a cool looking boss with really creepy lore, but his fight matches none of the spectacle. I like his damage phase too, but he never jumps on the plate to attack. He just kind of stands there and takes a beating. He's almost always a one phase with any form of coordination. Number 27. Spire of Stars has two encounters here already. Yet I would rank this one pretty solid of a start before the final boss. This one only finds itself here since it can just be tedious on repeat playthroughs. But disabling the Red Army's fleet from the Leviathan is at least a very sick set piece. There's big plates, then little plates, gas the ball up, 
throw the ball and then poof into a tube, then throw a poof and break some ships. And shit, it's pretty cool. But the boss does all of this very fast and then takes damage, so I struggle to find this one as fun as the boss fight on repeat. Number 26. King's Fall's original raid is finally complete on the encounter list. This time, the best encounter that everyone agreed could be even better in a remaster. Golgoroth. This encounter is really unique and requires the whole team dip into the pit for damage while two players juggle the gaze back and forth. The beauty was doing damage up close while Golgoroth sat there and enemies had to be cleared all around. The ugly side of this encounter was that you never had to leave the first pit. In fact, the longest any of these pits stayed around was the first one, so it was more beneficial to just one pit and roast the boss. There was no punishment for it. Golgi had great concepts, greater teamwork needed, unique damage, and situational awareness, but it needed a redo on some parts of it. Number 25. The last of the meh list is the last of the Leviathan raid, Callus. Callus became an absolute meme, and I feel a lot of people remember watching him for every exotic versus this boss, but realistically, Callus was a menace when he first came out. It took the Whisper of the Worm almost a year later to get Callus to easily go down to a weapon. Callus's meta of death before even Rockets was Cold Heart and Merciless to take him down. So how does this fight work? You need to shoot ads on all the sides, and then when Callus claps, players are sent to the Void to not get the suck, making sure Scions die. If you made it to the end of Void Room, you needed to shoot the Skulls to deal a ton of damage on the final plates. If in the throne room, you need to punch the scion with the odd symbol out, make these little cute stopping points for everyone stuck in the void. While shooting skulls in the void, the other players in the room needed to lower down the shields of Callus. If you didn't in time, you die. But if you did, then it was time for damage on one of four plates, changing every time it ran out of buff. By the end, Callus was a robot with a cool set of attacks that gets you off the plates. This one just became a meme, and three players in the throne room didn't really do too much, but I think Callus, with some love and reworks, would be a sick encounter again one day. Unfortunately, he had nothing even close to this in his boss fight in the campaign. Number 24. These are the good encounters. These encounters are just good. They don't do anything that's annoying in some way, they just feel fun to play every time, and they usually have something a bit better than meh to offer. First one up is the most fitting of good, the Sparrow Race in Scourge of the Past. This is pretty self-explanatory, right? You race away like Crash Bandicoot from this giant meatball through a ton of obstacles and enemies. What makes this one great is that hitting the buttons on the way through the encounter is what opens the chest at the end, so it can't be missed. Fun fact, this is where you got the always on time Sparrow, was from this exact chest. But we're not here to talk about the loot, we're here to talk about the encounter. I think this one is only this high because it's the only time Bungie did this for a raid encounter. Deepstone Crypt did the entrance, but this is a full encounter with good obstacles. Is it fast? Yeah. Is it fun? Also yeah. Bungie, it's time to make a long Sparrow encounter. Make it the long way. With areas you need to jump off your sparrow to get around through fast, do this crazy thing. I want to see boo! I want to see explosions! I want to see sparrows die. I want to see every single sparrow be as fast as always on time. Do it, cowards. I don't know why I just kissed the mic. Don't it you don't you don't need to include that. I just I just gave the mic a smooch for I don't know why. Number 22. More Scourge of the Past, this encounter still feels new every time I watch it because I cannot play it. The first encounter was all about balls and maps. This was another introduction to the mechanics encounter, but it's here because of the freedom you had as a player to maneuver around the encounter, and it's setting alone having some insanely fun verticality. How much fun would this be with Strand? A map reader could stay up top and read the map for players around with marked arrows. The map reader tells them where to find the Berserkers, a unique enemy to the raid that needs teamwork to break the shield, then kill. While you also need to tell them where to bank the nukes that drop from the Berserkers. Once one player dunks, they have a cooldown and need to wait before picking up another ball. The other ball that drops from the Berserker comes back to the map, since you also need to power that. 
after four dunks, you're done. But this area is massive. massive and just leaves you so many places to explore. Pair this with the secret Easter egg tank, and this area was a blast. There's not much else to say. It was a sparrow-friendly fun time. Number 22. Puzzles and small details are mechanics I feel are very subjective, like more subjective than the rest of this. Some people just want to Rambo some enemies. Others just want to do puzzles with no enemies. I think Vault from Last Wish does both of this very well. The Vault puzzle is complex enough that I recommend you watch my short on how Last Wish Raiders solved the original Vault encounter. But it finds itself here and not higher up on the list because three players do most of the fighting. Vault has some great stuff going on, and Bungie has never made a puzzle as hard as this in a raid again. But I'd love to see them try. Cowards. Number 21. After breaking down the shield of Argos, you need to take down the boss once and for all. Argos is one of the coolest bosses a part of a raid that just gets a notoriously bad rep for having an awful starting encounter. Argos has the player cook the craniums and move around the room to connect the charges and break the shield. Then you do some damage, you avoid the net of Argos, climb onto the platform, break the stun points to continue the encounter. Argos had a lot of health and was not a pushover, but Argos was always very fun. And a uh, fun fact, had a tongue for some reason. Number 20. Like father, like son. Wait, what? Crota is here, above Oryx. How did this happen? Well, it's a simple game of which one do I look forward to on repeat playthroughs? Crota, a boss that I can solo and have a ton of fun with, and even play as a six man and have a ton of fun with. Or Oryx, one giant loading screen on D1. I think you see my point now. Crota is not a team fight. In fact, Crota is the ultimate crown jewel of solo raid bosses, but that doesn't stop him from being fun. Crota is just pick up a chalice, kill a sword bearer, grab a sword, have your team or you take down Crota's shield, then do the damage with the sword. All the memes, all the solos, all the everything is still a lot of fun. Argue all you want in the comments, but Crota is just that dude. Number 19. Garden of Salvation's ending has a boss that I really hated at first. It has gambit mechanics, which are boring. It has you just clearing basic enemies, which is also boring. And Sanctified Mind is pretty boring to look at. But the more I kept playing this encounter, the more I started to appreciate it. Most teams hate this one, self-included for a while, until you hit that realization that it's one of the most team-oriented encounters out there. You need builders ready to go that also aren't getting in the way of other players. Communication, check. You need those immune shields accounted for. You need to watch out for the floor disappearing as a team. And damage requires good optimization for a one phase. Garden armor is basically a requirement to get the kill, which is rare that you need all the raid armor for the best everything, as well as fast weapon swapping and knowing what is meta. This raid and especially this encounter suffered from the treatment of being the only raid for a year and the fact that Xenophage was the damage meta for this boss for a long time, if it weren't for those gambit parts and the design of the basic looking boss, this would rank way higher. But I like where Sank ended up. I think it's a good spot for him. Number 18. Vault of Glass's remaster just made Atheon better. No, I'm not talking about the cheese where you could kill Atheon T-posing. And no, I'm not talking about that emote, the one where you push a little baby Atheon off the map. I'm talking about the encounter being remastered in all the right ways. Atheon requires team communication and cooperation. Even one missed set of oracles will result in a wipe. Atheon now made the oracles in the portal tied to the room where the boss spawns in. You also had to flip the room for players in the portals, so they were looking at what the starting team was looking at. Atheon wasn't done there though because the boss wasn't the easiest pushover anymore and actually had a lot of health to go with him and a detain bubble about halfway through damage. I like this one a lot since it's constant communication and will cause wipes if you're not careful. Also, damage is just more fun than ever before. Number 17. This one got bonus points because the room is just so cool, but Root of Nightmare's best encounter 
the planet room is here on the list. This encounter has been called out for being so unique to the rest of the raid in a good way, and deservingly, this encounter is just the best of the raid. Explicator or planet room has four players swapping planets around amongst each other across the room, then matching the light and dark planets in the middle for damage. Then phases of damage play out for an eventual kill on the boss. In all reality, it's simple, but I think I enjoy coming back here for the visual set piece alone. It may age poorly, and it may be a worse version of another encounter on this list, but for today, for right now, god dang it, I'm putting my finger right here. It's, it's here. Number 16. After a slog of fights with a boss that tortured many players, you may think the raid is over, but Queenswalk is here to remind you that's not the case. Queenswalk wins in the small details of raiding department because you are trapped inside the heart of Riven and can see your teammates hands holding you in the skybox. But Queenswalk also wins in being an epilogue for the ages. I can still hear the music. I can still feel the epic run to save the dreaming city and all the teamwork communication and obstacles on the way just added to that. I want to see Bungie make another epilogue encounter. Number 15. King's Fall Remaster had a lot of encounters near the top of the list, but we're here right now to talk about the War Priest. The remaster took the ideas of the original and made it way more team involved, making players grab a buff to swap with other players while the timer ticked down. Also making players swap around which plates even started the glyph sequence. These in combination with the War Priest having a massive amount of health all help the fight grow a lot more. And I always felt the only issue with War Priest was that one player was holding the aura the whole time while everybody else had fun. Issue resolved. Number 14. The first one up in the great category is one that would be a top 10, hell, even a top 5, if the boss had some health, or changes to make it not get eviscerated instantly. But Atrax is a wonderful encounter. You get just about everything here, from the boss being everywhere on each floor, to the ascent into space for the first time, and the fact that Scanner and Operator are used to perfection. Atrax on Contest before Lament was released, was the best version of this boss fight. And even the shanks were regular ones too, not the snipers we have now. So it would have been even harder and even more crazy on that day. This boss has such a unique mechanic of killing the real one, dumping the replicants into space, and going back and forth from Europa to space. It's truly an epic fight, but we have so many ways that you just never have to do most of it, which is such a shame. But if there's anything to give Atrax credit for, is that it's this high on the list and you don't have to do most of the fight. Number 13. Just like Atrax, this one would be in my top 10, at least had this boss not become a pushover health-wise these days. But Shurochi is an absolutely great fight. Look, I don't like health gates as much as the next guy. I actually have gone on record saying multiple times, I find them annoying. But when you have a boss with this much verticality, and quick thinking puzzle solving on the way, yeah, I gotta give it some props. Shuro has three players connect the triangle from the NOT beam to break the shield and do damage. Every two ticks of health, you need to go into the symbol room and fill in the blanks. This was stressful and it still costs a ton of lives in the symbols room alone, but Shuro not being a threat anymore is what lands her here and not in the top 10. Number 12. After a very fast-paced, high-intensity fight with Vosik, you'd be right to want to take him down once and for all. Vosik Phase 2 was worth a whole separate room. This boss had you killing plenty of adds, crawling up the sides of the arena and falling down from the sky, then spawning nukes to throw at the boss in unison. You had to get your throws timed decently well, or this wasn't going to happen. Once your damage began, you'd have to watch out for all the enemies still flying down. After that, it was time to scramble into the side rooms, ducking down and making sure your room is a safe option to get away from Vosik lighting the whole room up with SIVA filled monitors for a wipe. If you did this correctly, you'd also need to shoot a SIVA monitor as a team to prevent another wipe phase from happening. Vosik was fun, the arena was super unique, and I just love the pace of this fight. Number 11. 
Cracking just outside of the top 10 is a boss that for a while was a top 5 of all time for me, Golgoroth, this time remastered. I don't want this placement to make you feel any type of way. I still love Golgi, and the remaster proved all of my reasons to love the boss even more. Golgoroth remastered is what the original always wanted to be. Take the original, but force the team to move around during damage. But Bungie took it even further by having the teammate who gets the cursed thrall timer to run into the boss for a huge explosion of damage. This one is just great. Number 10. Insurrection Prime is so freaking sick. Remember everything in the shield encounter from Scourge? Well, it's here. But the boss also has a shield to knock down. This time, you need to work as a team to break the shield points on the boss, while teammates search for berserkers to kill and take the nukes to deposit stations to spawn a tank. Once both of those are done, you can shoot the boss with the tank to stun it and form a triangle of buffs with two players standing on each of them. Whatever order you like, it doesn't matter, all right, ACP, CAP, PAC gamers, relax. The encounter just gets better, and you are rewarded with higher damage for standing in the correct spots, while taking damage and dying, even with a well, if you're in the wrong spots. Almost everyone has a huge role here, and Insurrection was always so much fun to run it back. Number 9. Oh boy, here is a hot take for you. Oryx Remaster is here at number 9 and not in my top 5. Oryx does everything right, but this far into the list, we're getting really picky about everything. Every detail, every nuance, everything, this and that. And Oryx's one flaw is that the boss just sits there for damage. Look, I love the changes with the bombs now stunning Oryx for damage, and the plates aren't a complete requirement, but I will say that Oryx's damage phase has me just standing still the whole time. Again, he's a fantastic boss, but this is really the only thing that keeps him up here. Number 8. In the new era of contest mode, this boss shined like no other, having a consistent presence and a shock of a truly new enemy in Destiny. Rolk was amazing. Rolk has two main phases, one to match symbols and push shields backwards, and the amazing part, the damage. Rolk finds himself below another boss from the same raid, just because his first phase is really boring on normal raids post contest. Double dunking to make it faster is great and all, but all I want to do is run into the arena for a kickoff between the two of us and a duel for damage. If the whole fight were like part two, then this would be an easy winner for the number one spot of the list. But the whole first half is just too much buildup and not really fun. Number seven. Here's one that will definitely ruffle some feathers, but Exhibition is by far the best ad clearing encounter in Destiny 2. Exhibition has everything you could hope for in an encounter not having a boss. This one requires quick thinking, good communication, and fast movement of ad clearing. It feels like Queen's Walk with more relics and everyone needing to be involved. I truly love this encounter, even though I know for most teams it's frustrating. There's something about the combination of all these mechanics that makes it so special, and that feeling of relief every time you're at the end of the encounter when you just make it in time hits like no other ad clear encounter can in Destiny 2. Number 6. Wrath of the Machine is back again. Just like Vow, this raid has a lot of fast-paced encounters, and Axis is one of those for sure. Axis teleported around the room for a showdown and required you to get the balls from the servitors thrown at him to make him teleport in four different locations. If you missed, you just wasted all that time. If you stunned his back by jumping on it and slamming, however, you were in for some quick bursts of damage. If you haven't empowered, it allows you to slam on Axis' back, making everyone pay attention. But if you are on the other side from the boss with empowered, you could slam on a plate and get your whole team free supers and ready for a fight. This one could use a remaster just because I want to fight this boss again. I mean, I love Axis. Number five. Remember how I said Rolk needed to keep the intensity of phase two for the whole fight to be considered higher for me? Well, the caretaker does just that. In a fast paced, high action arena, there's a lot going on. Caretaker has two players stunning his back and face at all times, while two other players are fending off snipers and shooting the boss's bees from coming out of the caretaker's back. Two players are going back and forth inside with quick memorization of the symbols they pick up, and then shoot the totem in the middle to cleanse it after nine symbols are found and shot. Then you can begin damage. The Taken Wizards aren't really a threat, and it's my only critique, 
but the rest of this encounter slabs. For damage, you do it on three plates, something that Planet Room would shamelessly steal a year later. Once this is done, you need to backpack up the stairs of the arena and do this again in a new environment. If you over damage to skip the third arena and go straight to final stand, it really feels satisfying to pull off as a team. This encounter has all the boxes checked on my list for things that I enjoy in raiding. And this encounter, when broken down, is nothing short of fantastic. Number 4 Speaking of fantastic, and a fight that always keeps you flying, Galron. I admit, I have some bias with this one. I know that the boss had no health past the contest window, and I know there's encounters more advanced like the Caretaker, but I have Galron here because all sides are engaged in the same tasks and everyone had to be alert at all times for the crystal spawns, the deception spawns, who had the buff, and more. It was chaos on the comms, and Galron was just fun. When the deception spawned in, you needed to break the shield, then shoot Galron's hand when he did the fire attack. Doing this brought the cleaver down on the clone. As long as the shield was down, it would destroy it. But you need to get the witch's blessing again from different teammates now because you lost the buff, you punched the Galron bubble. It was a constant jumbled encounter. But when done right, it was game design poetry. After all three deceptions were killed, you needed to shoot the hands on Galron, then the face to either delete the fake ones or reveal the real one. Once that was done, it just came down to sending him home. Bonus points for the Crown of Sorrow falling down and trying to catch it each time too. Number 3 After a fast-paced two encounters leading here, it's quiet. Too quiet. Then you hit a wall, and that music kicks in, and it's on. Siege Engine is really that encounter taking all the fast-paced action Exhibition has while running the show on Fun Factor. You want to run full speed down the aisle? Well, you best watch out for all those slow mines, all those ships, the captains, the spider tanks, and more that are blocking your path. This asks that you carry the parts through obstacles and pits of death to get the parts on the siege engine to get it moving, all under a short timer to run it back. The fun comes from knowing you can optimize every aspect of this encounter down to ripping enemies quicker and being familiar with all the slow mine spawns. Of course, the payoff is extremely fun too. Guardian down. Number 2 The runner-up position. This is the most mechanic-heavy boss encounter there is, and I don't think it's a debate. Valkaor is a boss that feels like he was set for year 9 or 10 of Destiny 2, but came out in the double primary Warmind DLC. Val has mechanics on mechanics. First, you need to kill adds. Second, you need to catch a ball from the boss, throw it to each teammate, and then back to the boss. Third, kill gladiators and find out who has superior retainer. Fourth, big plates, then little plates, just like the last encounter. Throw the gas balls into the garage. Fifth, superior retainer, go into space with more gas balls and blow up ships. Sixth, catch balls as a team. With three balls being needed, throw them back and forth as a team to make sure you don't die from times 10, while also making sure the ball stays alive. Seven, throw the ball at the callous robot hand. 8. Damage the boss This boss was mechanically menacing, but for a whole year, this one was menacing as hell in the damage department too. Those mini-missiles would kill anyone in the room, and this is the hardest boss Bungie has 
ever made past day one. And I might even say if one boss wasn't 30 under for most teams on day one, this would also be the hardest on day one. Val was not messing around either because we actually have mechanic eight, final stand, where Val shot out a ton of balls. This time you needed to hit him with all of them or you were going to wipe there. So many deaths to this boss, but it's one of the best of all time. Number one. You knew this was going to be here, or maybe you didn't, but this encounter is one that I don't think can ever be topped. It's just that good. Last Wish had been building to a moment, a boss that we didn't even know what to expect, a voice that was trying to trick us like it did Aldrin in the campaign. Meet Riven of a Thousand Voices. Oh no! There's a giant dragon. Oh! Oh! Oh shit! Oh! Dude, look at this thing! Holy shit! Look at this thing! She's on. She's on a big awoken dildo thing. This boss, done the way it was intended to be done, splits the team into two sets of three on each side of the tower, crystal side and tree side. One side will get the boss in the room early and needs to stun her in one of two ways, either by baiting a slam of a tentacle, then shooting it in a tight window, or baiting fire breath and shooting her mouth in a tight window. Once stunned, she reveals two of ten eyes. This needs to be told to the other side which ones to shoot. Back to the other side, the boss will eventually show up after being stunned and will try to wipe everyone but reveals her eyes. During this window of damage, you need to know the eyes callouts from your teammates who stunned and shoot the boss in the correct eyes to stun her again. Once you have done your roll on either side, you need to pick up a taken essence and call out the symbol you see on the totem. Once the correct symbol has been coordinated in red and all the comms and everybody's shouting back and forth and back and forth and I hate you and I'm gonna find a new team. I hate LFG, this is why I always hate LFG. I'm going to Reddit to farm gold. You get through it eventually. And eventually, you slam with the grenade button with the taken essence on the correct symbols. This causes a lift to activate at the back of the room. After this, the two sides swap roles from the last time. And then up to the top, everyone goes to meet once more. Now that everyone is at the top, it's more stuns and eyes while killing ogres and goblins. Once Riven has been stunned three times, it's time for more damage. After six eyes, you hop back on the starter plates. But this time, you will need to shoot the taken blights on her body. Shooting these is where most of the damage comes from. Oh yeah, I should also mention that Riven has three final stands. After doing enough damage, you need to climb the Taken Realm to reach another Blight. While your health is ticking down, you jump into the Taken Blight to free everyone. And then final stand two, you need to stun her mouth for the kill. But that's not the actual kill. After you stun her mouth by doing more damage, you need to jump into her mouth to then shoot the heart to get the encounter done. What an encounter, right? Unfortunately, unless Bungie can fix the cheese on Riven one day, or make us actually engage in the mechanics nobody wants to do. Nobody wants to do Riven this way. And I don't blame them. Riven can be easily cheesed by putting all six players on one side and over damaging the boss. This was done in week two of Last Wish's release, and I just don't think Bungie wants to update Riven. It's a real shame though. So I'm gonna call an audible. Riven would be number one if you had to do the mechanics. And in my experience, she is the number one for that. But the most complete without any flaws, and the most complete for this list, is moving Valkaor to number one. Rest easy in the sunset world. May you soon come back to destiny. Well, that's the list. And man, I don't want to look at another raid encounter for a while after this one. I think this and my review of Lightfall will be the last two videos I do on destiny for a bit. Unless something pressing comes up. This is while I focus on my second channel, Evan Explains, and my stream at EvanF1997. Thank you guys so much for watching this far, and have a nice day. I'll be seeing you. Mm.